how do we know that God is loving and giving and justice-minded and inclusive and non-judgmental and a teacher and a healer and all that, except for the person of Jesus? Yeah. The omnipotent God that is creator is not somebody I can ever be. If being Christian means to be living a life like Christ, to be a little Christ, that only means something if you have an idea of who Jesus is. Welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. I'm Julie Richter. I'm the pastor to the Access community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me, as always, is our worship director, Eric Chikowski. What's going on, Eric? Not too much. How's it going? Yeah, it's good. Good. Well, we are in our third week of our sermon series, I Believe. Last week, we spoke specifically about God as creator. And today, we're going to be focusing on the Son of God. Jesus Christ. We've got a really exciting interview in the Reverend Deborah Hobbs Mason. She's our executive associate pastor at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and we're really excited to talk with her in a few minutes. But before we get to that, we really want to dissect who is Jesus? Who who is this person that we not only follow but claim as our Savior as Christians? Yeah, so in the Apostles' Creed that we've been talking about and that this series follows the last few weeks— the personhood of Jesus takes up a huge chunk of our creed. And so there's a lot to cover today about who Jesus is. And one of the things we want to talk about is, is Jesus fully human and fully divine? There was a group of Christians in the early church that believed that Jesus was certainly fully God, but maybe not fully human. And the problem with that is that if Jesus is not fully human, then does Jesus really understand our suffering? And does God really understand our suffering? And then you've got another section of Christianity that leaned more towards Judaism that believed that Jesus was certainly fully human, but maybe not fully God. And that poses some problems for us as well. As many of you may know, the religion of Islam and Judaism and Christianity all share uh, most of the books from the Old Testament. So really, the differentiating factor that we as Christians claim is that we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and in that, fully divine uh, and fully human. So we're going to be talking to Deborah today about that question and about who Jesus is in our life. If we are Christians, if we are Christ in this world, what does it mean for us to follow the teachings and examples and stories of Jesus's life so that it's not just about Jesus's story in life, but about our story in our life as well? We are here with Deborah Hobbs Mason. Deborah is the executive associate pastor at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and we are really glad to have you. Thanks for taking the time with us. Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah. So, we'd love to hear just a little bit about your family and maybe your upbringing. What did faith formation look like for you growing up? Did you grow up in a Christian home, or what did that look like? So I grew up in a Christian home. My grandfather's United Methodist pastor in the Texas Conference, and my dad was the minister of music at St. Stephen United Methodist over in Mesquite, and occasionally my mom played the organ. So definitely grew up in the church, um, was active as a youth in choir. It was a small church, didn't have much of a UMYF, so choir was the big thing, and we performed Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm. Oh, yeah, the Classics. good ones. Yeah. <laughs> so I started out, my first role was the seed on the pathway, <laughs> and I graduated all the way to playing Judas in wow. Jesus Christ Superstar. So that's an odd thing for somebody in your listening audience that a, a woman played Judas, but there weren't enough guys who could sing. <laughs> and it was pretty progressive church. Um, so definitely grew up in the church. Just don't know a time that I didn't know the Christian church and the faith. So music was a huge part of all of it. So how did music help shape your beliefs? Oh, my goodness. When I, I feel like when I went to seminary, I knew my faith better from the hymnal than from the than Bible. from the Bible, yeah. hundred um, percent. I remember literally putting tabs on my Bible before I went to seminary because <laughs> I didn't want anybody to know. <laughs> I couldn't judged. find the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely a huge part. And my dad was the minister of music but didn't like Amazing Grace. Like mm. the 
classic, right? Didn't like at all in the garden. It was too anthropomorphic. It was too Jesus really friendly, walks with me, talks with me. He's my friend. That just didn't speak to my father at all. I came to realize that later. I don't know that he told me that as a child, but I just began to realize there's just some like classics that we don't sing very much. The Mm. church that I went to was formed in 1960. They thought themselves pretty intellectual and Mm. hip and socially active. And there were just a lot of hymns I didn't learn. Um, So what I mainly got at my church growing up was Holy Spirit and God omnipotent. Not a lot of Jesus because they seem to be avoiding this real human oh, Jesus, you know. Wow. And so I think I said to you one time, people worry about people going to Perkins School of Theology and losing their faith. And I actually found Jesus yeah. there. <laughs> and what I mean by found Jesus there is how do we know that God is loving and giving and justice minded and inclusive and non judgmental and a teacher and a healer and all that, except for the person of Jesus. Yeah. The omnipotent God that is creator is not somebody I can ever be. Mm. If being Christian means to be living a life like Christ, to be a little Christ, that only means something if you have an idea of who Jesus is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So was there a moment in seminary or a class that you mm. remembered that that you went, oh, wow, this really makes Jesus real for me, or, or was it a little bit more progressive than that? What they look for when you write your credo in seminary is a consistency of theology. If you said one thing about Holy Spirit and something very, very different about um, God the Father or Jesus, where it sounds like there's three gods, then if it just doesn't hang together, you don't pass that class. And right. So I think systematics probably was the place I had to get in touch with all the different aspects of God. I tried really hard, I remember, in my um, credo to figure out a way to not use the word father and son Yeah. to be more inclusive, yeah. my being a progressive woman. <laughs> um, and I just couldn't get away from it because that's the relationship of the Godhead. And mm. I think if we are going to be in relationship with others, um, we need God's own relationship in the Godhead to drive that. Yeah. yeah. So you talked some about us being little Christs out in the world and about our actions really backing up the things that we say we believe. So how do you go from finding Jesus, um, or how did you go from finding Jesus to actually following Jesus? So I mentioned that my church of my childhood was justice-oriented. We were very involved in the civil rights movement in swapping choirs with a African-American church. They came to lead worship for us, and we went to lead worship for them. Oh, and this wow. is in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Wow. Mm, that wasn't done a whole lot. No, that wasn't done a whole lot. And so, and I remember being in the back of my parents' car when they had a black family, and they were helping them find housing that was appropriate in Dallas. And so I found Jesus in the adults around me, who were caring for others, who were loving, who were reaching across, especially racial lines. My mm-hmm. parents were in a group called the Salt and Pepper Group. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just what you think it is. <laughs> but it was intentionally bringing black families and white families together. And we had fish fries and we had times to just, yeah, absolutely food. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's Brings awesome. everyone to the table. Mm-hmm. You absolutely. Know? Yeah. And we played together and we talked together and we realized, oh, surprise, we're human beings and we all have the same needs and the same desires and we live in the same town. And I mean, if we look at the people that Jesus invited to dinner or went to dinner with, oh, it yeah. was not just the ones that looked just like him mm. and made decisions just like him. Yeah. And so becoming a follower certainly was something that I, you know, definitely high school, you can't perform musicals about the life of Christ and not do some deep thinking, even as a young person. But probably right after college was when we were detaining refugees and folks that had fled El Salvador and and the war. And I went with a group and we interacted with folks and it just was, it was really powerful I followed my heart to go and meet some people very different from me who've had Mm. a real different experience. And I think that we definitely are called by Christ today 
just like I was as a child in the 60s, to stand up for justice and mm. to reach out to people that are very different from us. And my life has been enriched through the years more by the relationships with people that were very different from me than the ones that are just like me. Yeah. You know, the ones that are just like me don't push me much, mm. you know, to grow. And um, But the ones that are very different do. I think there's this notion that if I disagree with you, we either can't love each other, can't be friends, can't talk to each other, can't do anything. And that lack of mutual respect or understanding just seems just tragic. And so what a beautiful example and reminder for us as a way that we can follow the example of Jesus. The way I read the gospel, he didn't use those moments as a moment to preach either. Right. He was genuinely entering into their lives, listening, loving. Being in community together. Yeah. Being in community. No ulterior yeah. motive. Present. That's right. Yeah. 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 Right. So we've given you the part of the creed that is the major chunk. You know, we talk about God as creator at the very beginning of the creed, and we talk about the church at the end of it. And then this massive part in the middle is all Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so you, mm-hmm. you got the big block today. And then right in the middle of the creed where it says, um, conceived by the Holy Spirit and uh, born of a virgin and then suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. So before we ever get to resurrection, there's suffering and there's death and there's struggle. And so how do we understand tragedy and how have we been affected by the story of Jesus in connection to Jesus' suffering and maybe even our own suffering? What comes to my mind is um, I lost both of my parents when I was in my early 20s. Mm. And so my mother passed away first and two years Later, almost to the day, my dad passed away, one with cancer and the other with a cerebral hemorrhage, died suddenly. Um, And I remember vividly the night that my dad died after everyone had come to visit and sort of all the things that had to happen happened and I was alone. It was a really stormy night. And I remember at some point days later saying to somebody, you know, as alone as I was, now an orphan. I mean, even when you're in your 20s, you still feel like an orphan. Mm. Um, I wasn't alone. God was there in the midst of that. And so um, I think God's presence with us in tragedy is just the rock. It's the foundation. Mm. I wonder if your upbringing, your foundation, your spiritual discipline as a family that really rooted you in that faith allowed God's presence to be evident to you in the time of tragedy. And Mm. I was listening to a pastor recently preach about that very subject, that sometimes I don't feel God's presence with me and and his question. And and it was a very earnest question about how's your prayer life and how's your walk with the disciplines and are you in church and are you in community and are you in small group? And do you have these earthly institutions that keep you centered in the word and in your relationship with Christ. And not that that's a formula necessarily, but mm. but just by the practice of continuing to really lean into that faith, the hope that we place in all of that work and in all of that discipline is that in, in those times of tragedy that we'll be able to draw on that strength. And it can be as simple as, for, well, it was for me, it was attending church and singing. You yeah, know, being in the choir, it really wasn't three or four very specific disciplines, work with a spiritual director, I mean, any of that in those early days. Right. And, you know, another thing for me, my home church talked a lot about God the Father and Holy Spirit and not so much about Jesus, but I have a very high Christology in that Christ is risen, which means Christ didn't rise and just go up to heaven to sit with God. But risen means is among us, is already working. And that if I'm praying and if I'm being faithful, then I'm wanting to see what's Christ doing in the world and how can I be a part of it? Mm. You know, sometimes we use the phrase in the church, being the hands and feet of Christ, you know, being about the work of Jesus in the world. So uh, can you think of a of a example or a story or experience where you've seen that recently, where you've just seen God busy? Well, it may sound strange, but the first thing that comes to my mind is in my interfaith work. I have worked with the Richardson Interfaith Alliance for about five years now. And there are persons who are Muslim and Jewish and Hindu and Buddhist and different Christian denominations. And we've had a couple different Thanksgiving gatherings. One time 
Thanksgiving was the focus. One time, compassion was the focus. And different persons from different faiths would sing songs, say prayers, read holy scriptures. And when you hear them one after the other, it just shows so much more similarity than difference. And a couple of times we've gathered and done a Feeding Children Everywhere food bagging event. And people of all different faiths are literally at a table bagging food for hungry people. And we all care about hungry people. We all care about a world that is safe. We all care about our children being educated. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to have a world in which the golden rule is present and alive and active. Every one of the world's religions has that as, as its base. And when we're together and maybe talking about something difficult, God's busy. God's busy knitting us together, reminding us that we are one human family. God desires in God's very being that we be in relationship with one another. God created us to be in relationship with one another. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think in even the stories of Jesus that we've talked about, I mean, that's the image of feeding the 5,000, right, is is the people coming in groups, and, and there's food involved, right, the commonality <laughs> of food, but of people gathering and Jesus bringing those different sorts of people together around something that's common and something that we experience as grace and God's love. And I think in the story of Jesus, it's interesting to me how there's just never a glossing over of suffering. And there's never a glossing over of struggle, but yet we're just not called to stay there. Right. And the story of Jesus is one that doesn't stay there. And, and that calls us to something, something good in our world. If you had to articulate in just one word or a few, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is the one who helps me know who God is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jesus is God incarnate, fully human and fully divine, which means in his fully humanness that I've got a chance at being Christ-like and having eternal life, and in his divinity, giving himself for us completely, fully, freely, loving us when we haven't deserved it. And Jesus is grace. Jesus is my ultimate hope. Um, If God was just creator and left us here, I don't think it would make the difference that Jesus makes Mm -hmm. in our lives. That's really good. All right, so can I throw the final curveball question? Okay, so we ask everyone at the end of the podcast one final question. So this can be really serious if you want it to be, or it can be not serious at all. Uh, so at this point in your life, what's the one thing you wish somebody would have told you? That I was enough. <sighs> <laughs> She wins the prize. She wins. <laughs> she wins. <laughs> That's great. Deborah, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing a little bit of your story and your thoughts on Jesus. You're welcome. It's good news. It is. Very good news. And so how do we know that we're enough? Well, we know because... The person of Jesus sat with a woman at the well. The person of Jesus called Peter out from the boat and said, walk to me and you won't sink. And if we find ourselves doubting or we find ourselves lacking that faith uh, that we truly are enough, we really have to look no further than Jesus' own words. I want to leave you with the scripture today from John 14. And it says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to More Than Sunday. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts to not miss our next show. If you want to find out more about the Access community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at accessfumcr.com, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Big thanks to Deborah for joining us this week on the show, and make sure and tune in next week as we have a conversation with our children's director, Cheryl Bishop, as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Have a great week.